Pep Guardiola insists the 115 financial charges facing Manchester City represent a completely different case to Everton's Premier League points deduction and cannot be compared. The Toffees were handed a 10-point sanction after being found to have breached financial rules. City boss Guardiola was asked if he was worried what could happen to the club after Everton's punishment. It's two different cases. It's not the same, honestly, said Guardiola. Speaking on Friday before his league leaders face second-placed Liverpool at Etihad Stadium on Saturday, 12.30 GMT, Guardiola added, I spoke with my people. They, said it is completely different. Okay. Our, one is longer because it is more complicated because it's 115 breaches. So wait. Then the lawyers from both sides present their cases in front of the judge and, we receive, the verdict. City are the only other club to have been charged by the Premier League for alleged financial breaches. They were referred to an independent commission for allegedly breaching the rules more than 100 times between 2009 and 2018, and were also accused of not cooperating since the investigation began in December 2018. City were charged in February, before Everton, and their case is still ongoing. The independent commission which is overseeing the case can impose punishments ranging from a fine and points deduction to expulsion from the Premier League. City have always denied financial wrongdoing. Asked if he would consider his future if City were expelled from the top flight, Guardiola said, I will wait. Wait and see it, and after the sentence has been done we will come here and explain it. But absolutely I will not consider my future, if it depends being here or being in League One. Absolutely. There is more chance to stay if we are in League One than if we win the Champions League. I know when people are saying, OK, City, why don't they go to the, National League? Wait. After, the decision is made, what's going to happen is going to happen. What people accuse us of, we do not agree with what they say. We are going to defend, ourselves, and after the resolution is done I will be here, like a spokesman for my club. Meanwhile, Chelsea could face further scrutiny from football's authorities over reports former owner Roman Abramovich used offshore companies to make tens of millions of pounds worth of payments to agents which were not officially declared. Chelsea were fined £8.6 million by European football governing body UEFA in July for submitting incomplete financial information between 2012 and 2019 as part of a settlement for breaking financial fair play rules. Analysis Simon Stone, BBC Sport I could not be sure how Manchester City boss Pep Guardiola would react when I asked him about the club's Premier League charges. Sometimes, he just closes down while on other occasions he is quite expansive. Guardiola has said in the past if City are found guilty he would leave but that was not the message today. Today he was vowing to stand by the club no matter what. However, he stressed an important point. Everton were charged with breaching FFP. City have been charged with hiding sponsorship deals, paying Roberto Mancini via a third party and not cooperating. Evidently, The cases are completely different and it may be some time before Cities is concluded. Sean Deitch says Everton feel aggrieved at their disproportionate 10-point deduction for breaching financial rules. The Toffees were given the biggest sanction in Premier League history last week, dropping them from 14th to 19th, joint bottom alongside Burnley. The club has said it intends to appeal. Like everyone in these parts, I was shocked. From The wave of noise it seems like everyone in football was shocked, said Deitch. The enormity of it. Disproportionate is a word being used and obviously we are going to feel aggrieved by that. Despite the punishment, Deitch says his job hasn't changed and his players are prepared for the next challenge. The Toffees host Manchester United at Goodison Park on Sunday, kick-off 16.30 GMT, and, after a poor start to the season, go into the game having won six of their past nine games in all competitions. It doesn't change the focus, which is sorting things out on the pitch, getting the team to win and the performances to feel different, said the former Burnley boss. We were on the right lines for that and delivering strong performances. The punishment, has given us a pushback to go forward again. The job hasn't changed for me, but, it has made it more difficult in the current circumstances until the appeal. 
I spoke to the group and said the league table is one thing, the final league table is the truth. The deduction, enhances what we are doing, because it means, we have to go harder for longer. They are the rules of football. Deitch insists on us against the world mentality. Everton say the financial breach centers around interest payments for their new £760 million stadium at Bramley Moor Dock. The club believed those interest payments represented permissible add-backs for profit and sustainability calculations in the 2021-22 financial year, but the investigating commission disagreed and did not accept the club's claim of mitigating factors. Director of Football Kevin Thelwell said Everton's spirit remains strong and unwavering, and insists the club is united. Meanwhile, a group of fans has raised more than £40,000 for anti-Premier League protest material for Sunday's game. Deitch said, I can't get involved in all of that, but, there is a, swell of toffees getting behind the club, and the feeling of Evertonians is one of, injustice. There is a feeling of standing stronger more than ever, and all we can ask for is their backing and support in the stadium. They will be supporting that team and we need to continue building the connection. What happens on the pitch is the vital thing. We have been changing that, the results have shown that. Asked by BBC Sport if there is an us against the world mentality at the club now, Dyke replied, I don't think it is an internal thing, it should be the mentality anyway. I understand why fans are, feeling that way now, but I have been searching for that mentality regardless, the inner belief of being able to take anything on. I want that mentality, not just in adversity but when it is good as well. The real bond of a group, is, to be true to what it is, Manchester United goalkeeper Andre Wanana is set to be fit for their Premier League match against Everton. Wanana, 27, was injured late on in Cameroon's 3-0 victory over Mauritius in a World Cup qualifier last week but has trained before Sunday's meeting. United boss Eric Ten Hag also said defender Luke Shaw will be available but there are doubts over striker Rasmus Hoagland's fitness. Andre is OK. He stepped in during training, so he is good, Ten Hag said. Rasmus is a close finish, he is training, he is down and outside. He is making very good steps and we will have to wait to make a final decision. Denmark international Hoagland suffered a muscle strain in the second half of United's 1-0 win over Luton at Old Trafford on the 11th of November. United are boosted by the return of England defender Shaw, who has recovered from the thigh muscle injury which had kept him out since August. Asked about Shaw's return, Ten Hag said, You can mention many things, you can mention his physical and his technical ability, his leadership. It's clear, a long time in the season we didn't have a left fullback so yes, we're very happy he's back. That's a good sign and he will help us, to be, more stable. Ten Hag also dismissed claims of a fallout between himself and French centre-back Raphael Varon. It had been reported that the Dutchman's decision to pick Johnny Evans ahead of Varon for the Manchester derby last month resulted in tension between the pair. Ten Hag denied there was any issue between the pair and added, I don't know what you're talking about, with, these rumours. He's a very important player, but there's internal competition and that, is how it, should be at a top club as we are. There is internal competition. When you have to decide on two players, who do brilliant, Raphael Varon and Harry Maguire, you have to make a choice for the position. England captain Millie Bright has withdrawn from the squad for the final two games in the UEFA Women's Nations League because of a knee injury the Lionesses realistically need to win both games to keep alive their chances of reaching the Nations League finals. England are at home to the Netherlands on 1 December then away to Scotland four days later. Manchester United defender Millie Turner has been called up in place of Chelsea centre-back Bright. England also need to reach the Nations League finals to keep hopes of Olympic qualification alive for Team GB. They must do so without Bright, who has been serving as England captain in the absence of the also-injured Leah Williamson and led the Lionesses in their run to the 2023 World Cup final. Bright, who was an injury doubt before the World Cup in Australia and New Zealand, was absent from Chelsea's 4-1 victory over Paris FC in the Women's Champions League on Thursday evening. The 77-cap defender has now withdrawn, and is replaced by Turner, 
who is uncapped at senior international level despite having previously been called up by England. England are third in their nation's league group following a shock 3-2 defeat away against Belgium in their previous match, trailing the Dutch and the Belgians in Group A1. They are three points behind the Netherlands and a point off Belgium, and likely need to win both matches to finish top of the group and progress to the finals while hoping other results go their way. Full England squad. Goalkeepers, Mary Earps, Manchester United, Hannah Hampton, Chelsea, Kiara Keating, Manchester City. Defenders, Lucy Bronze, Barcelona, Jess Carter, Chelsea, Neve Charles, Chelsea, Alex Greenwood, Manchester City, Maya Leticia, Manchester United, Esme Morgan, Manchester City, Millie Turner, Manchester United, Lotta Vuban Moy, Arsenal. Midfielders, Grace Clinton, Tottenham, on loan from Manchester United, Fran Kirby, Chelsea, Georgia Stanway, Bayern Munich, Ella Toon, Manchester United, Kira Walsh, Barcelona, Katie Zellum, Manchester United. Forwards, Rachel Daly, Aston Villa, Lauren Hemp, Manchester City, Lauren James, Chelsea, Chloe Kelly, Manchester City, Beth Mead, Arsenal, Alessia Russo, Arsenal. Arsenal boss Mikel Arteta says he will continue to freely air his views on refereeing decisions despite facing a football association charge. Arteta is waiting to see if he faces punishment for comments after Arsenal's 1-0 defeat by Newcastle on 4 November. He called the video assistant referee's decision to not overturn Anthony Gordon's winner an absolute disgrace. I am going to speak. I think you have to be yourself and as a leader you have to be authentic, Arteta said. You cannot be someone you are not and this is who I am. Arteta, 41, has formally submitted his thoughts to the FA in relation to his comments over Gordon's 64th-minute goal, which ended Arsenal's unbeaten start in the Premier League. There were three VAR checks, to see if the ball went out of play, if there was a foul and if there was an offside, which all came back in Newcastle's favour. Speaking at a news conference on Friday before their match at Brentford, the Gunners boss cited the, the importance of freedom of speech and said he believes communication will improve refereeing standards. We have, sent our observations to the FA, and we will try to give our point and the reasons why and there's not a lot I can comment on, Artita added. When you get asked to give your observation you have to do it in the right way and there's a process in place to do that. It is good that we are communicating and we all want to improve the game. Referees, managers, officials, sporting directors, journalists, we all want a better game. To get a better game we need freedom of speech, respectfully and in a constructive way, but we have to promote that. It is good that they are talking in front of the media about decisions because it brings clarity. Third-placed Arsenal travel to Brentford at 17.30 GMT on Saturday. Pilots and air traffic controllers have been helping England's top referees. It is part of Howard Webb's drive, as head of refereeing, to improve standards around the Video Assistant Referee, VAR, system. Two pilots spoke at a professional game match officials limited, PMOL, training camp last month. They offered their insight into the best method of communication in a stressful situation where multiple voices are having an input. A previous visit last year from air traffic control staff, prior to Webb taking on his role at PMOL in December 2022, was arranged for the same reason. Webb has been on the back foot following a number of VAR controversies this season. On the opening weekend of the Premier League campaign, he had to apologise to Wolves manager Gary O'Neill after Manchester United goalkeeper Andre Wanana was not punished for punching striker Sasa Kalutzig in the face in stoppage time. Wolves lost the game 1-0. Then Liverpool were denied a goal at Tottenham in farcical circumstances on 30 September and VAR Darren England thought he had confirmed a Luis Diaz goal but was actually endorsing an incorrect on-field offside decision against the Reds forward. Spurs won the game 2-1. Meanwhile, Arsenal boss Mikel Arteta is facing an FA charge after calling the decision to award Newcastle a goal in their match at St James's Park on 4 November a disgrace. In Arteta's view, VAR ignored three incidents in the build-up all of which would have seen Anthony Gordon's effort disallowed. The following day Arsenal released a statement in defence of Arteta. 
Webb subsequently said on the internationally broadcast Premier League match officials mic'd up program he believed the decision to allow the goal had been correct. In last month's meeting, as reported by The Times, it was outlined that pilots have communication with numerous people before takeoff and often have to speak to operators for whom English is not their first language. The need for clarity and accuracy was stressed. Although match referees do not hear the conversations in the VAR hub, there can often be three voices talking at the same time, with the VAR periodically communicating with the referee to let him know what is happening. In the aftermath of the Diaz incident, Webb introduced new communication protocols, which included confirmation over what the VAR was confirming. Meanwhile, it is understood Webb has also reminded referees of the need to take action against players waving imaginary cards after what appeared to be a lessening of the hardline approach used at the start of the season. It was supposed to be a triumphant homecoming. The start of something special for both club and manager. Instead, Rafael Benitez's return to Spanish football at the helm of Celta Vigo has, so far, been a big disappointment. The team from the northwestern corner of Spain are marooned in the relegation zone with just one win from 13 games, and Benitez's future is the subject of repeated speculation. This weekend he travels to Valencia, the club where his glittering coaching career was ignited two decades ago with two La Liga titles in three seasons. The contrast between his achievement at the Mestalla and the current state of his Celta team could hardly be greater, and right now the 63-year-old's hopes of proving that he should still be regarded as a top-class coach are backfiring. High expectations, early disappointment. Felter have gone through a long list of coaches in recent years, all of them unable to turn the team from perennial relegation strugglers into challengers for European football. This summer, the Galician club decided to raise the stakes and set their sights on Benitez, who last worked in Spain with a brief spell in charge of Real Madrid in 2015. Sensing that Felter were a notch below the status of clubs to which he was accustomed, Benitez took some convincing. But eventually, with the help of a higher salary than their usual rate of pay, Felter persuaded him to agree a three-year contract. The timing was significant, with Felter in their centenary season and opening a new stand. After years of fighting against the drop, Last season they needed a final day victory over champions Barcelona to stay up, the club were determined to reach the next level. An experienced, elite coach was required, and Benitez was their man, but cracks appeared immediately. A deflating 2-0 home defeat by Osasuna was accompanied by uncertainty over the future of star player Gobri Vega. The midfielder was eventually sold in late August to Saudi club Al Oli, leaving Benitez with insufficient time to suitably reinvest. More disappointments soon came, 1-0 home losses against Real Madrid and Mallorca were followed by heartache at Barcelona, when a 2-0 lead was squandered by conceding three goals in eight minutes. After a 2-1 loss at lowly Las Palmas, the growing strain on Benitez's nerves really started to show at the next home game, against Getafe. The visitors played the last hour with ten men after Domingos Duarte was sent off, but labouring Felter still had to settle for a 2-2 draw. On the final whistle, Benitez preferred to blame Getafe's cynical-slash-clever game management tactics rather than his own team's shortcomings, ranting at visiting defender Damian Suarez, you're going to destroy football like this. But things were about to get worse. Divine inspiration and the laws of physics. Felter emerged from the October international break by suffering a 3-0 pummeling at home to Atletico Madrid, with Benitez complaining that an early red card for goalkeeper Ivan Villa after a last-man foul on Alvaro Morata was the game's decisive moment. The following weekend he was even angrier. With the game at Girona goalless, Felter midfielder Luca de la Torre slotted home, only for a VAR review to disallow the goal for a supposed foul on home keeper Paolo Gazzaniga. I don't understand at all, bemoaned Benitez, whose mood worsened when Girona subsequently snatching an injury time winner. I don't know what they saw. We will analyze it to see if divine inspiration gives us an explanation. A week later, Felter was seething again. A home game against Sevilla was tied at 1-1 in stoppage time when Felter were awarded a penalty for a foul by Jesus Navas on Tossos Duvacas. Lo and behold, 
The decision was then overturned after a VAR review concluded there was no foul after all. Star striker Iago Aspas exploded, kicking over the VAR monitor on the sidelines. Benitez resorted to sarcasm, offering an idea to improve VAR by quipping, we have to bring in a physicist to tell us force is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration, and we have discovered how much is required for a professional footballer to fall over. The luckless pattern continued in Thelta's last game, away to Athletic Bilbao before the international break. Benitez's men led 1-0 and 2-1, but Aspas missed a penalty and the hosts grabbed an injury time 4-3 winner through, you guessed it, a penalty awarded on VAR review. Out of luck, out of time. The idea that Thelta are victims of bad luck is a handy narrative for Benitez, but it's only partially true. You don't fail to win 12 games out of 13 solely because of a few dodgy refereeing decisions, and the truth is that Thelta have been poor for much of the season, especially defensively. Beset by needless errors and below-par individual performances, the stats suggest Thelta aren't near the bottom by accident, they have the fourth lowest average possession in La Liga, the fourth worst shot-to-goal conversion rate, and have made fewer tackles than any other team. A specific concern is Thelta's tendency to collapse in the final stages. They have conceded 10 goals in the last 15 minutes, a lack of durability that reflects poorly on Benitez's ability to develop a resilient group. There has also been tactical uncertainty. The season started with a flat back four, which changed into a back five at halftime of the second game of the season, at Real Sociedad. When that approach led to an improvement, Benitez stuck with it for a while. But then reverted to a back four just six weeks later. Nevertheless, he has avoided the sack, with Felter reluctant to make a quick change after investing so much, financially and emotionally, to recruit him. And significantly, the fact he signed a three-year contract on a relatively high salary means a payoff would be prohibitively expensive. Results must soon improve, though, and it's thought that Benitez has until the Christmas break to turn things around. There would be no better place than Valencia, the scene of his greatest early triumphs, to start that process. Former Manchester City striker Mario Balotelli is in good health after being involved in a car accident, say his Turkish club Adana Demirspa. Journal Lady Brescia reported the incident happened in Balotelli's hometown Brescia on Wednesday when his vehicle crashed into a wall. No one else was involved and the 33-year-old was able to walk away from the car, which was severely damaged. The former Italy international is currently recovering from knee surgery. We would like to inform you that our player Mario Balotelli, who was involved in a car accident yesterday in his country, Italy, is in good health, resting in his house now and doesn't have any health issues, the Turkish Super League club said in a statement. Balotelli rejoined Demirspa in September and made five appearances this season before being ruled out with injury. He rose to prominence after joining City from Inter Milan in 2010, helping them win the Premier League for the first time and a FA Cup. After his exit in 2013 he joined AC Milan and then Liverpool, before spells in France, Italy, Switzerland, and Turkey. He won the last of his 36 caps for Italy in 2018, but was called up for a training camp in 2022.